If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, Ghosts, Magic, Spiritual Warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawite, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying Create Account. Click on that and follow the instructions. Tonight we're to talk about how to meet the doctrine of election. And the doctrine of election is that God sovereignly chooses some people to be saved, and all that he chooses to be saved are going to be saved, and nobody else is going to be saved. Now, I want to say in the beginning, and I say this as seriously as I know how, all sincere Christians do not agree with me on the doctrine of election. I have some godly Christian friends who don't agree with my understanding of election. And if you walk out of here tonight and disagree with what I say, that does not mean you're not a Christian. It does not mean that you're not a good Christian. You may be a better Christian than me. John Calvin will never examine you at heaven's door to see whether or not you get into heaven. All that one needs to be sure he's going to heaven is that he is in Jesus Christ through faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God's work in his heart. It is not our theology that gets us into the kingdom of God. And I say that seriously so that you will be able to listen without thinking we're trying to talk you out of your salvation. Now having said that, then we must also say you have to believe something about election. If you say to me, the Bible never mentions election, the Bible doesn't use the word predestination, then you're saying you don't believe the Bible because the Bible does talk about those things. 
and you must understand them to mean something. Now, you may totally disagree with me and say, I don't think it means what you say it means, but you can't deny that it's in the scriptures in some way. And when Christians just argue over this subject of election, and by the way, the word predestination means that God predestinates everything that happens. And election is the doctrine of predestination de, de, uh, applied to the area of man's personal salvation. So the argument is not, does God sovereignly choose some people and not others? Uh, you can't read the Bible once without seeing that's a fact. So the argument is not over that. The argument is over, why does he choose this one and not that one? And the one will say, because of free will, and the other will say, because of free grace. For instance, when you come to the nation of Israel, nobody's ever read the Bible one time and didn't come to the conclusion that Israel was the chosen nation of God. Now, we may argue as to why he chose Israel instead of Egypt, but we can't argue over the fact that he did sovereignly choose Israel over all other nations on the face of the earth. In Ephesians, we read that we're chosen in him before the foundation of the world. We can't deny that. We can argue about what it means, but we can't deny what that says. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. We may argue about what it means, but the fact it is there, we must do something with it. I want to take four biblical examples tonight and show the right way and the wrong way to respond when we're confronted in the scriptures with this truth of God's sovereign electing grace. The first one is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is the first correct way to respond. And if we had a text for the sermon, this would be it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. We have been chosen. One of the first things to do when you study a Bible doctrine is look up the meaning of the word and make sure you understand that. What does the Bible mean when it talks about being chosen? Well, if you go back to 1 Samuel, you remember where David went down to the brook and he chose five smooth stones. Now, when you read that, what do you imagine David did? Can anybody imagine that David looked at that brook and there were five stones who somehow wiggled or somehow communicated to David their willingness to be chosen? Or do you think that there was somehow that David foreknew which five would be willing to be put in his bag? Or do you read that and get the impression that David sovereignly chose the five stones that he saw would fit his purpose and the choice was 100% in David's mind? Well, in the same sense that David chose those five stones is the exact same way it means that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. So the Bible teaches it. Now some people say, well, the Bible teaches that our free will is what gets us salvation, and then God's predestination has to do with where he wants us to serve, but has nothing to do with our salvation. But if you look at this text, it says, we are chosen unto salvation. And the NIV puts it even more uh, plainly, and it says, we have been chosen to be saved. So we have been chosen to be saved. I remember hearing an illustration by a southern evangelist. He says, God votes for you, and the devil votes again you, and you cast the deciding vote. And everybody laughed, and he laughed like he laid an egg and didn't know that he did. <laughs> well, Ralph Barnard, a southern Baptist evangelist, used to say the trouble with that illustration is the devil wasn't a registered voter in that election. And secondly, <laughs> secondly, this election took place in eternity before you were born, so you didn't have a vote, and that only leaves one. A better illustration is the lady came to her pastor, and she says, I don't understand this election business. And he said, well, are you saved? She says, yes, you know I'm saved. He said, well, did you save yourself, or did God save you? She says, Pastor, you know that only God can save you. 
Well, he said if you're saved and, and God saved you, uh, did he do it all by himself or did you help him a little bit? Oh, no, 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 no. He did it 100%. Well, he said, I have one more question. If you're saved and God did it and he did it 100% all by himself, did he do it on purpose or was it an accident? <laughs> now, that's election. God sovereignly, consciously, deliberately chooses to save certain people. Go to John chapter 10, verse 14, and I want you to notice how our Lord Jesus clearly taught election. And I chose this particular text because it's in the Gospel of John, and everybody calls the Gospel of John the whosoever gospel, and rightly so. But it's also the gospel that the most clearly teaches the doctrines of God's sovereign electing grace. In John chapter 10 and verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Nowhere does it say he lays down his life for the sheep and the goats. He lays down his life for the sheep. He died for the sheep and for the sheep only. Verse 16, he says, Other sheep I have, they're mine right now. They're my possession. I own them. They're my sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. I think he's referring to the Gentiles. And then he says, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold. And Jesus can hear speak of people who at that moment are lost. They're outside of the fold. But he can speak of some of these as his. He owns them as his sheep. And he is positively sure that these will hear his voice and that he must bring them because the Father gave them to him. He will bring them and they will hear his voice. I don't think anybody can read this and be honest with the meanings of the words and say, Jesus did not clearly teach the doctrine of election. I learned the doctrine of election very shortly after I was a Christian. And I learned it of all places in the Mennonite church. The Mennonites are not famous for believing in election. I think I went to the only one in Pennsylvania that believed it. And I went to prayer meeting there and the first night I went to prayer meeting, the pastor was preaching. Out of, it wasn't even a pastor. It was the farmer, a farm man, who was teaching the gospel of John. And he was in verse 24 through 27. Look that up, if you will, for a moment. And uh, he was a good teacher. He was a farmer, and he had gotten a hold of some books by a man named Arthur W. Pink on the gospel of St. John, and he was using that as his reference material. And these are the verses he was teaching that night, verse 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If you be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you believe not because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I give them eternal life. Now, as I say, this fellow was a good preacher, good teacher. He used an object lesson. He had two chairs in the pulpit, and he had two big poster boards. And in this poster board on the right-hand side, he had written, they heard and believed not. And on this poster board, he had written, they heard and believed. And I said, well, he's orthodox so far because that's what it says. You believe not. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep believe. And then he says, now why did this group not believe? And he turned the card over and it had on it the word goat. <laughs> and he says, now why did this group believe? And he turned the card over and it had on it the word sheep. And then he says, now, now according to these verses, he says, does hearing and believing make you a sheep? Or do you hear and believe because you've been chosen to be a sheep? He said, that's my last question. If you're ever in an argument and you're losing and the guy says, I got one more question, that's the time to run. Because you might get the red rug pulled out from one of you. And I sit and I looked at this text, verse 26. You believe not because you're not my sheep. That's what it says. Oh, how many people would love to hear that say, 
You are not my sheep because you are not willing to believe. If you would be willing to believe, you would become one of my sheep. It doesn't say that. It says you believe not because you are not one of my sheep. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's clear, isn't it? Clear as a crystal. Now that night, for the first time in my Christian experience, I understood and realized that a year before in a little church, I was not a goat who changed himself into a sheep by an act of his so-called free will, but I was a lost sheep that was found and brought safely into the fold by the shepherd to whom I had been given by the Father. And I walked out of the church that night, my head was spinning. And I looked up in the sky and I saw the moon was full and the stars were bright. And I knew that before that moon had ever shown a beam of light or those stars had ever twinkled, I had been chosen to be a sheep. And I cried. And I've cried a lot of times since that. I cried tonight as we sang that hymn. It was not that I did choose you. No, no. No, no. It's the other way around. These texts clearly teaches the doctrine of election. Now, one thing other before we leave this text in 2 Thessalonians, it says we're bound to give thanks always to God for you. Election in the scriptures is always preached in the context of joy. And it's always preached to the hearts of God's people. When Paul says, according as he has chosen us and him before the foundation, he's not a theology professor in a seminary preaching abstract theology. He's talking to people like you and me. He's talking to the people of God and giving them a, a reason to rejoice. And our text says we're bound to give thanks to God. So that's the first way to respond to election. Give thanks for it. Rejoice and thank God it's true and it's true of you. That's the way to respond to the doctrine of election. We are bound to give thanks to God for you. We are not bound to give thanks to you that you had enough sense to become a Christian. No, no. It's always that you praise God. The Apostle Paul always credits the conversion of himself or anybody else's conversion. He always attributes it to God. He never attributes it to the will of man. When Paul gives his own testimony in the book of Galatians, how does he do it? He says, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me. That's the way Paul gave his testimony. He didn't say, when I decided to let God save me, or when I decided to give Jesus a chance, he says, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb. Paul always testified like this. By the way, some people say you should never talk about election if, if, if there's anybody who is a non-Christian in the audience. That's not true. Do you know the first Christian truth that Paul learned was the doctrine of election? When Ananias came to him and said, the God of our fathers hath chosen you. That's the first lesson he learned. And when he said that, he was giving his testimony to a bunch of lost people. And so when he preached the gospel, he testified that the only reason he was a Christian was because of election. Go to the book of Acts chapter 13, verse 48, and notice how Paul did the same thing here. The book of Acts chapter 13 and verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. How many believed? All those that were ordained to eternal life. Did all who were ordained to eternal life believe? Yes. I want to come back to this text because Paul isn't preaching the gospel here. He's telling what happened when the gospel was preached earlier in the chapter, and that's a very important point. In the book of Ephesians, you have the same thing. When it says, he chose us in him, but he says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath chosen us. See, that's thanksgiving. 
Blessed be our God. Psalm 65, blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach to you. Always in the context of joy. And, and if the doctrine of election doesn't thrill your heart, you, you don't understand it correctly or else something's wrong with your heart. Because always in the scriptures, it's in the context of joy. That's why Paul uses the doctrine of election to encourage worship from Christians. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, Paul says, uh, What have you that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? That's a good question. What have you that you've not received? I remember the first time God pressed that verse in my heart. In my first pastorate, I worked as a bricklayer. And because uh, they didn't pay me enough to eat, so I had to get a job. And I remember one morning reading chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians. And, and, and boy, this verse jumped out at me. Who maketh thee to differ from another? And I went to work, and I kept thinking about this verse, and I packed, picked up a black man, 80 years old. He told me some of the things that he had suffered because of the ignorance and the prejudice and stupidity of men. And all the time he was talking, I thought, who maketh thee to differ? How come I'm white and never had all of those things happen to me? Why, why didn't I have that prejudice and hatred against me? And, and here's a man who, who is my brother, and he endured all of those things just because of the color of his skin. You look at your hands. Most of them are white. Is that right? Well, let me ask you this. When did you vote to be white? What did your free will have to do with whether you're white, black, yellow, or red? Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. I went on to work, and I saw my boss's son, 26 years old, had on a pair of diapers, a little rubber hammer. He had the mentality of a nine-month-old child and would never have any more. Now, I graduated from college, had two children who were doing very well in school with good IQs. And I thought again, who maketh thee to differ from another? What hast thou that thou dost not receive? How many of you voted that if you couldn't have an IQ of at least 140, you wouldn't want anything to do with this thing called life? What did your free will have to do with your mentality? I visited a down syndrome institution when I was in university one of my psychology classes and after we had visited this and it was a horrible thing to behold they couldn't even teach these children to control their bowels they just pushed them aside every half hour and sprayed the whole thing with disinfectant and when we walked out of there one of the kids that I had witnessed the gospel to turned on me and he was gritting his teeth he says you say that God will be glorified in everything I said, no, I didn't say that. The Bible says that. And he says, you show me how God will be glorified in that. And I said, I can't, but you'll eat those words. My dear friend, you can ask me lots of questions I can't answer. <laughs> and I can't understand mental retardation. And I can't understand why myself, my wife, and my two children were born with a good IQ and none of them were Down syndromes but I know that's a fact of life over which I have no control and you have no control either. Is that right? I don't care if it's the color of your skin or if it is your mentality, your free will had absolutely nothing to do with it. That same day I went into the post office to get my mail and I stuck my key in my box, box 221, and I heard a guy use my name with a string of curse words like you wouldn't believe. John Reasing, are you blinkly blink, 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 blink? And I turned around and I saw a fellow I hadn't seen for 21 years. The last time I saw him, we'd been drunk for two days and two nights. He said, let's go have a beer and talk over old times. <laughs> I said, ah, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> and I told him the gospel. And he stood there and looked at me when I told him I was a preacher. And all of a sudden, he just burst out laughing. I thought he flipped his lid. He said, that's the best one you ever told yet. He thought, I, <laughs> he thought I'd put him on. I had to take him down around the corner from the post office where my name was on the bulletin board of the church before he would believe I was a preacher. <laughs> and he walked away shaking his head. <laughs> and the tears rolled down my cheeks and made a puddle on the pavement. And if you'd have said to me, well, now, John, the difference between you and him is, 
if he wasn't willing to believe in you were, I think I'd have been angry with you. Because I knew the difference had nothing to do with anything in here. It had something to do with something up there. If you would have taken a, an election on Company B in the Ninth Special CBs on Guadalcanal, who's the least likely to become a Christian? I'd have been first and he'd have been second. And there I was, a preacher of the gospel of the grace of God. Why? Who maketh thee to differ from another? I don't care if it's the color of your skin. I don't care if it's your IQ. I don't care if it's your salvation. It's always the same. Some people say to me, why, why do you preach election when, when you know there's some Christians who don't believe it and sometimes even get irritated? And I say, well, I don't have any choice. If I don't, I'm disobeying the scriptures. What does it say? We're bound to give thanks to God. I got no choice. I got to preach it or else I'm disobeying the scriptures. Sometimes people say, well, why do you preach on it so often? <laughs> and I really don't. One time is too much for the guy who doesn't believe it. But what does the text say? We're bound to give thanks, what? Always to God. Always. I think we ought to acknowledge the grace of God in everything we do. In our music, it ought to exalt God's sovereign grace. Doesn't James say, go to now you that say next year we'll do thus and so? You better say, if the Lord will. We ought to acknowledge God's sovereignty in everything. When I was in Canada, there's a guy who didn't like the doctrine of election. He didn't like me at all. And uh, his, his son got converted under my ministry. I thought, sure, that would soften him up, but it didn't. And then she, he started to date a girl, and she got converted. And even that didn't help. And I had the privilege of marrying them, just a lovely young Christian couple. And during the wedding ceremony, I said, do you believe that God in his sovereignty chose you for each other and that his sovereign providence brought this day to pass? And afterwards, he was furious. You can't even marry people without talking about the sovereignty of God. <laughs> Why should I? Why should I not talk about it? We're bound to, bound to do it always. All right, so the first way to meet the doctrine of election is just give thanks for it from the depths of your hearts because it's the only reason you're a Christian. It's the only reason you're a child of God. Now let's look at Romans 9. In Romans 9, you have the first wrong way to meet the doctrine of election. And, and this is an important chapter because it deals emphatically with two of the major objections that men have to the doctrine of election. And those two objections are, number one, it's not fair. Now, if you use that objection, I'm sorry, it's already been used in the Bible and answered. So you can't use that one. And the other one is, well, if that's true, then man's only a robot. Sorry, that one's also been used. And in the book of Romans, it uses both of these. I was up in Montreal one time with a group of university students, and a girl said to me afterwards, she says, where does the Bible clearly teach election? I must have mentioned it in a sermon. That slips out when I preach. Uh, but anyhow, I said, <laughs> I said, why don't you read Romans 9? And she had a modern speech translation. And she started to read Romans chapter 9. And she got down to, it is written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And she stopped. She says, that's not fair. And I said, what's the next verse say? And the next verse in the King James says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. And her modern translation said, you will say to me, but that's not fair. <laughs> she said, that's what I just said, isn't it? <laughs> I said, yes, it is. Now listen carefully. If you say election isn't fair, you're using the very objection that Paul says those who disagree with him will use. You're fighting the scriptures. Sorry, can't use that one. It's already been used. This is an amazing text. A lady came to Mr. Spurgeon. She says, Mr. Spurgeon, Romans chapter 9, verse 13, just gives me fits. I can't understand it. 
He says, I know, dear, I can't understand it either. She says, I'm so happy to hear you say that. She says, when I read Esau, I have a hated. She says, I just can't understand that. Oh, Spurgeon says, that's no problem to me at all. It's the other part. Jacob have I loved. <laughs> that's the part I can't understand. And that's the part I can't understand either. And he is. Jacob have I loved. God calls himself, it's his favorite term of the Old Testament, the God of Jacob. He doesn't call himself the God of Joseph. or the God of Jacob. Why? Because he's the God of election. But also, more importantly, if he can save a wicked heel catcher like Jacob, then no sinner can ever despair of the grace of God. If he can save Jacob, he can save anybody, even you. And that's why he puts this in here, to give us hope and to give us courage. Well, the lady went on with her reading, and she got down to verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. That's the kind of verse you just read and shut up and gulp. Mm. And she stopped again, and she says, why, 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 man's only a robot. God can't hold him responsible. I said, what's the next verse say? And the next verse says, you'll say to me, why does he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? And her modern speech translation <laughs> again says, you will say to me, man's only a robot. God can't hold him responsible. She says, I did it again. <laughs> listen, listen. If you say that election does away with man's responsibility, it only makes man a robot again. You're fighting the scriptures. You're using the very objection that Paul raised and answered, so you can't use that election. And how does Paul respond to both of these objections? When, when, when it says, Jacob have I loved, and he says, um, but then that's not fair. How does he respond? Why, he doesn't back up. He takes a text out of the scripture, and he says, doesn't the scripture say that God raised up Je uh, Pharaoh for this purpose? And he doesn't back up at all, but shows the sovereignty of God in dealing with Pharaoh. And then when he comes to this, man's a robot idea. How does he answer that? He doesn't back up. He says, wait a minute, God's the potter, you're the clay. Can't he make of the clay whatever he wants to? That's the wrong way. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Just bow down and accept it. Don't fight it. Henry Ironside was a great preacher, Plymouth Brethren preacher, and he used an illustration about his grandson. He had a, a bear rug. It was a rug made out of a bear skin and had the bear's head and the teeth, and he would put this on him and look out through the teeth, and he would chase his grandson around the house. I'm a big bad bear. I'm going to get you. I'm a big bad bear. I'm going to get you. And his kid would scream. And one day he cornered him in the bedroom and he kept getting closer and closer. The kid's screaming as loud as he could scream. And he says, I'm a big bad bear. I'm going to eat you. I'm going to eat you. And he got right up close to him. And his grandson all of a sudden threw his arms around that bear head. You're not a bad bear. You're my grandpa and you love me and you're not going to eat me. <laughs> That's the way to meet election. You are not a big old mean God. You're a gracious God that you would even condescend to talk to a sinner like me. Is that right? Throw yourself right in its teeth. The second wrong way to meet election, the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. The Gospel of Luke chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 16. And he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he'd opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. 
And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? They were enthralled. He said, Man, what a preacher. What a preacher. They were hanging on every word. And they just loved him. Verse 23. And he said this unto them, You will surely say to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And what they're saying is, you're our hometown boy. You're from this vicinity. We hear all these things you do. Do some of these things here. I mean, you owe us a bigger show than you put on over there. After all, we're your hometown people. You have an obligation to us. In verse 24, he said to them, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elisha, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. Eli, not Elisha, pardon me. When great famine was throughout all the land, but none of them, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Serapita, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eli Elias the prophet, but none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now, now those were two stories that they knew. They knew those from childhood. They, he wasn't teaching them anything new. They all knew this. From, it was like, that was like David and Goliath to us. That was stories. Look at the next verse. And all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They wanted to kill him. Now, what made them so mad? What made them so angry? The doctrine of election. You see, it wasn't these two stories which they already knew. It was the application he was making of these two stories. They said, you owe us these miracles. He says, I don't owe you anything. Don't you remember in your own scriptures how the Lord came to one leper and he bypassed all the others? That's election. Choosing one, bypassing these. And that one wasn't even a Jew. He was a Gentile. And he came to one woman, one widow, and bypassed all the other widows. And that widow wasn't even a Jewish he was a Gentile, and they hated him because he preached the doctrine of election. The wrong way to meet election is to say, no, 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 I'm different. I deserve salvation. I exercise my free will. I give God a chance. My salvation is not all of grace. I did a little bit. That's the wrong way to meet the doctrine of election. Let me show you the second right way to meet the doctrine of election. We looked at two wrong ways, one right way. Here's the second right way, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Beginning to read at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. This is Gentile territory. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now, now, all you know about Jesus, you would expect the next verse to say, He heard her and answered her request. That's exactly what you'd expect, but you don't hear that. He answered her not a word. He just ignored her. There's no way to show contempt as much as to just ignore somebody. You go to the banker and you ask him for a loan and he just doodles on the paper, you know. <laughs> Doesn't say anything. That's the way you show contempt. And, and this is almost as if Jesus is showing utter contempt for this woman. He answers her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They came and they said, Get rid of her. She's making you look bad. I mean, I mean this, is a, this is a bad city. This is bad PR. She's going to hurt the offerings. I mean, get rid of her. Get her out of here. I, I think they thought he couldn't do anything about it. 
He answered and said, but he's not answering her, he's answering them. See, this is talking to her through a third party. That's really the worst way to show contempt. It's like in the mother and father having a fight at the breakfast table, and the father says, you tell your mother so-and-so. She's sitting right there, tell her yourself. And the mother says back to the daughter, you tell him, that's awful. And yet that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He is speaking to her through this second party of the disciples. But he answered her not a word. And then he answered them and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's election. He beat her over the head with the doctrine of election. Then she came and worshipped him. She wasn't about to be put off. <laughs> she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Boy, you can just feel the need of this woman, the pathos in her voice, and she's crying out in desperation. And what happens? He answered and said, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Whew. Man, that stings 2,000 years later. This is so totally unlike our Lord. And what would you have done if that would have been you? You said, well, he sure isn't anything like I heard he was. <laughs> or we might well say, nobody's going to call me a dirty dog when I'm in such pain and need. In verse 27, this is wonderful. Oh, this, this is one of those verses that just want to make you shout. She said, Lord, you're dead right. Truth, Lord. I am nothing but a dirty dog, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. You're right. I'm only, I'm only a dirty dog, and you are so great that all I need is a little crumb from your table. That's all I need. And he says, lady, you don't get a crumb. You can have the whole loaf. <laughs> That's the way to respond to election. Just like she did, you hang on to God. You hang on to his election because it's your only hope. And when you realize you're a dirty dog that has no claim whatsoever, you use that as a basis for your appeal. <laughs> Is that right? And you know something? If he turns you away, you'll be the first one he ever did. There's nobody ever acknowledged there were nothing but a dog who needed mercy that he ever, ever turned away. But he must bring us to that place. I confess I don't understand this passage. I think it has something to do with dispensations. I think it has something to do with her as a Gentile coming and saying, Thou son of David, she has no business to say that. He has to move her off of that position where she comes with nothing but her guilt and her shame. I think it also has to do with teaching those hard-hearted disciples the less all that's involved in it. But the one thing that's involved in it, that, that woman had the grace of God in her heart because he put that grace there and she persevered until she had a hold of God and knew that God had a hold of her. And that's what we do with the doctrine of election. We just throw ourselves right straight in its teeth. Now let me quickly cover a couple of objections to the doctrine of election and some problems with it. First of all, one of the worst things you can do is confuse the doctrine of election with the gospel. The gospel is not the doctrine of election. You can preach election without ever preaching the gospel. The gospel is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The gospel is only possible as a working thesis because there is election. But election isn't the gospel. Election never saved anybody, never will save anybody, but election makes sure that some people will be saved. And it makes the gospel work, not vice versa. You remember we said in our text, 2 Thessalonians, that we're to give thanks to God who chose us to be saved through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. You must repent, you must believe, and if you don't repent and don't believe, then you will not be saved. And if you're here tonight and you will not repent and believe the gospel, you'll be lost. And you'll be lost because you will not repent and believe the gospel. We must never fail to preach the gospel and preach it with all of our strength and our being 
And then we cry to God to open men's hearts. See, there's some people, because they believe election, they don't believe in the free offer of the gospel to poor sinners. I like that course, I have decided to follow Jesus. Because that's true. Repentance and faith are not the acts of God. God doesn't repent for people. Jesus Christ doesn't believe the gospel for people. You repent and you believe. And repentance and faith are the acts of men. And they're the willing acts of men. The most willing thing you ever did in your life was repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Is that right? I have decided to follow Jesus. Sing with me. Sing that chorus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. If you didn't sing that, you're hyper Calvin. <laughs> Now, that's true as can be, but it's only half of the truth. See, that's only half the truth. And if we let it stand right there, we, we're not telling the whole story. See, I added a couple verses to that. The next verse goes like this. Sing it with me. Why did I decide to follow Jesus? Why did you decide to follow Jesus? It was the Spirit who gave me faith. It was the Spirit who gave me faith. It was the Spirit who gave me faith. No turning back. No turning back. I decided. He gave me the faith. Why did he give you faith and not somebody else? How come you had the faith to believe and somebody else didn't? Well, we need another verse. <laughs> the Father chose me in sovereign grace. The Father chose me in sovereign grace. The Father chose me in sovereign grace. No turning back. No turning back. The Son redeemed His chosen sheep. The Son redeemed His chosen sheep. The Son redeemed His chosen sheep. No turning back. No turning back. Well, I'll guarantee if you understand that God shows you that Christ died for you and the Holy Ghost gives faith, you will decide to follow Jesus. You will never, ever again turn back. We don't deny the necessity of repentance and faith, and we do not hesitate to preach the gospel. We do not hesitate to say, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. <coughs> don't confuse election with the gospel. Now, there are two common false ideas, two characters that people use to lie about us. And they say that we believe there's people all over Austin who want to get saved, but God won't save them because they're not elect. That is a wicked lie. We believe God saves everybody who wants to be saved. Everybody who calls on his name, he turns none away. The second lie is they teach that we believe there are some people who are thrown into heaven, kicking and screaming, who don't want to go there, but because they're elect, they're gone. And here they are, kicking and screaming, I don't want to go to heaven. In you go, you're one of the elect. <laughs> oh, what a wicked lie. No, no, he makes his people willing in the day of his power. Nobody ever went to heaven that wasn't most willing. But that willingness came from the grace of God through the preaching of the gospel. Somebody says, Mr. Riesinger, you you pretty good so far, but you, you forgot that all this is based on foreknowledge. Oh, sure, God chooses people, but remember, it's on the basis of his foreknowledge. Go to Romans chapter 8, the passage which is used to overthrow the doctrine of election. This foreknowledge is like a big rug, 
and you just sweep the doctrine of election right under it, but I tell you, it makes an awful big lump. It really does. You have that great text in Romans 8, 28 that promised that God works all things together for good. Well, how can he do that? And for whom does he do it? He does it for those whom he's called his elect. Well, how do we know for sure he can do it? Verse 29 begins to tell us why. And this is the foundation upon this, which this verse is built. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them, only them, all of them he also called. Whom he called them, only them, all of them he also justified. And whom he justified them and all of them he also glorified. Now notice in verse 29, it doesn't say what he foreknew. It says whom he foreknew. He foreknew people. And the word know means love. Adam loved his wife. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. That means you only have I loved and chosen. And Jesus said, depart to me, ye cursed into everlasting damnation. I never knew you. Well, that doesn't mean he didn't know all about them. It's because he knew all about them that he cast them into destruction. It means I never knew you in a way of love. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Well, he knows the way of the unrighteous, but he watches over the way of the righteous. So the word know means love. The word foreknow means forelove. And if you want to understand this text of Scripture, there are five links in one chain. Foreknowledge is the first link. Predestination is the second link. Calling is the third link. Justification is the fourth link. And glorification is the fifth link. There's the only place in all of Paul's epistle that he jumps from justification to glorification without ever mentioning sanctification. Not because he doesn't believe it, but when he's talking about the purposes of grace, once you're justified, glorification is assured beyond question. And if you want to understand this, go backwards and start with glorification. Who's the man who's going to wind up in glory? Why, the man who's justified from all of his sins. Well, who's the man who's going to be justified? The man who's called and who's the man who's going to be called? The man who's been predestinated. And who's the man who's been predestinated? The man who's been foreknown or foreloved. You see it? It's important you get that calling in there because we're taught that God calls all men and those who are willing to believe those he predestinates. No, no. We are called because we're predestinated. And in this text, everybody without exception who's called is also going to be justified. Whom he called, he also justified. You can't get in there. He called all and justified those with their free will who believe. No, no, all he calls without exception will be justified. If you want to understand what foreknowledge means, you go over to Peter where it says Christ was foreknown. Same word. He was foreknown. God foreknew that Christ would die. Well, how did God foreknow that Christ would die? Well, he had the ability to look into the future. And he looked into the future and he says, now if I send my son, this is what's going to happen. They're going to crucify him. Well, I agree to let him be crucified. I, I agree that, that this, this is going to take place. So he foreknowed. That's nonsense. Jesus died because God purposed that he die. He gave him for the express purpose of dying. And in whatever sense Christ was foreknown to die, in that same sense I was foreknown to believe. The foreknowledge of God is like the foreknowledge of an architect. And the man who designed this building, he had perfect foreknowledge. He looked into the future. He says, let's see, uh, so-and-so is the contractor going to win the contract. He likes this kind of windows, so we'll incorporate them in. So he put those kind of windows in. And he likes a building this big, so we'll make it this big. <laughs> and because he had perfect foreknowledge of all of the contractors and what they like and what they would put in, then he put that in his design. You say, that's as stupid as anything anybody ever said. Well, of course it is. You know why they have this kind of lights? Because that's the kind that somebody designed to put in here. They're not here because somebody has foreknowledge of what somebody liked. They're here because that's what somebody purposed to put in here. Is that right? And it's that sense that God has foreknown the church. 
We, we better say one more word about this foreknowledge. Because if, if we don't, we're going to have some people who fuss with us. And also this idea of not fair. See, this thing goes to the root of a lot of problems. If you had a lady in, in Austin who was very wealthy and she went down to the local orphanage and she chose two orphans and adopted them and gave them her money and her love and her affection, would anybody in Austin say she's as mean as can be because she didn't take four or six? There wouldn't be one single word of criticism. Why? Because she didn't have to take any. <laughs> and everybody would laud her for her generosity. And let God do the same thing. Let him choose some and leave others and then even go to these others and freely offer them the gospel. And somehow or other he becomes me. Nonsense. I have a friend who was trying to teach a class of boys and girls, teenagers in high school, this truth. And he had seven kids in his class. And one Sunday morning he came to class and he got an envelope out of his pocket. He says, now I have a dollar in this envelope and I'm going to choose one of you seven to give it to he says, do I have the right to choose any one of the seven that, that I want to? They says, yeah, it's your money. <laughs> you don't owe any of us anything. So he gave one of the kids a dollar, and he opened it up, and there was a dollar, and he thanked him for it. And he said, the other six, what do you think about this? They said, that's okay with your money. Don't bother us a bit. So he, he took two more kids, and he gave them an envelope. And they opened up, there was a dollar. They thanked him. Now three got a dollar, and four don't. And he said to the four that don't know, what do you think? They said, this begin to be fishy. <laughs> and the three that had the dollar says, no, 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 you just agreed a minute ago that he didn't have to choose anybody. And now all of a sudden you're saying something's finished, the same deal, it's still his money. So he got three more envelopes out and he gave it to three kids and they all opened up and had a dollar and now there's one kid doesn't have any dollar. And he said to the kid, he said, now, honestly, how do you feel? I was cheated. And, and the other six says, what do you mean you were cheated? How could you be cheated? <laughs> you, you agreed it was his money. He could do it. How could you possibly accuse him of being unfair or cheating you when you've already agreed he didn't owe you anything? So he got another envelope out of his pocket. And he gave it to the other kid, and he opened it up. And there was a $5 bill. <laughs> And what do you think the other six said? <laughs> These same guys are saying he has the right to do what he wants to. Why didn't you give us the $5 bill? That's exactly what you're complaining about if you complain about unfairness in the doctrine of election. Once you get the doctrine of depravity straight, that God owes no man anything. I better finish. It is going too late. I'm sorry to keep you for so long. But this is the last night of the conference, so we can get away with it. Somebody, somebody says, Mr. Rizzer, how can you be sure that you're elect? If only the elect gets saved, how can I be positively sure that I'm one of the elect? Well, there's two ways you can find out, positively for sure. Get a ladder that's long enough to reach heaven and climb up and find the book of life and see if your name is written in it. <laughs> and if you can't get a ladder that long, there's another way. You know what it is? You believe in Jesus Christ. God's never told you to figure out whether you're elect or whether anybody else is elect. Election is God's business and your business is believing and he can take good care of his business. You get to believing the gospel. And that's the only way we can know for sure is that we believe the gospel. In Matthew chapter 11, you remember that great passage where Jesus said, Woe unto Charzen, for if the mighty works had been done in you that had been done in Charzen, it would have repented. And you, and you want to just scream and say, Well, why weren't those works done? And then finally Jesus said, even so, Father, for so it seems. Well, look at the passage. Look at Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11. Because this is an amazing passage of Scripture. In verse 26, after this dialogue with these talking about Charzen and talking about Capernaum, he says in verse 20, 
4, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and the land of judgment than for you. And you want to say, why didn't he do those miracles there? At that time, Jesus answered, but nobody asked a question. Then he's answering the question that everybody's asking. Why weren't those miracles done? At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Why? Why? Why does he choose one and not another? Why does he take the gospel to northern Africa and not southern Africa? Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Boy, that's high doctrine. That's sovereignty. Unless Jesus Christ chooses to reveal the Father to you, you cannot possibly. That's high doctrine. That's election. That's sovereignty. But look at the very next verse. And the very next verse says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And right alongside of this awesome sovereign verse is this free offer of the gospel. Sometimes this is put in one verse like it is here in one text. In context, in John 6, verse 37, it's in one verse. All the Father giveth me will come to me. No cobwebs in heaven where there are chairs and houses where the occupants weren't willing to come. No, no, no. Everybody who's chosen are going to come. All the Father giveth me shall come to me. That's election. But wait a minute. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That's the gospel. And people say, how do you get these things together? How do you reconcile them? You don't reconcile friends. You only reconcile enemies. And election is no enemy of the free offer of the gospel. They're friends. And if you say to me, how do I get them together? I'll say to you, how do you get them apart when Jesus Christ puts them together? And if he puts them together in one verse, how dare you separate them? How dare you preach election without preaching him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And how dare you start in the middle of the verse and say, him that cometh and point to the altar and forget to say all the Father giveth me shall come to me. One last thing. Nobody who goes to hell will ever blame election. Never. If we could go to hell tonight and bring every soul who's there up on this podium or any soul who will ever be there, there will not be a single one of them who says, I'm in hell because of election. We could bring those Jews up who perished and say, why are you in hell because of election? No, 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 I'm in hell because I would not believe the very scriptures that God graciously gave to me. I hated and rejected the very Messiah that he sent. That's why I'm in hell. And we bring the pagan up and say, why are you in hell? I'm in hell because I would not follow the revelation that God clearly gave me. Read Romans 1. That's my biography. Read about me in the book of Isaiah. I'm the guy who cut down the tree and then took half of the tree to build a fire and the other half to build an idol. I knew it was the same tree. I knew better. Bring some children there who come from a covenant home and they're covenant children and they've been signed and sealed in the covenant. Say, why are you in hell? They say, I'm in hell because I wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ. I trusted in my instant baptism. I trusted in my sign. I trusted in my parents' faith. But there'll never be a soul who says, I'm here because of election. I wanted to be saved and God wouldn't do it. Never, never, never. And likewise, we can bring every soul in heaven down on this platform and say, why are you in heaven? And there'll never be a single one of them who will say, I'm here because of my free will. Paul, why are you there? Because you faithfully served as a part. No, 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 I was the chief of sinners. I'm here only because God chose me and saved me by his grace. Nobody will ever testify that they're in hell because of election. They'll testify in hell because they will not believe the gospel. And if you walk out of that door tonight and you're not a Christian, 
There's only one reason you're not a Christian is you will not repent and believe in Jesus Christ. That's all. That's all. If you were a four-legged sheep and you were caught in the thicket and you couldn't get loose and the more you struggled, the more the briars caught your wool and finally cut your flesh and you were bleeding and you were hungry and you were thirsty and you were cold and finally you quit bleeding and you just said, I'm going to die. And you lay down to die. And all of a sudden, on the other side of the hill, you heard a voice, and it was the voice of a shepherd you recognized, and that voice was saying, Mary, where are you? What would you do? You'd say, bah, <laughs> as loud as you could. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Let me tell you something else. If you're a two-legged sheep, and you're caught in the thicket of sea and then you can't get loose and the harder you try the worse it becomes and your life is a mess from top to bottom and you're filled with despair and you say there's no hope there's no place to go I might as well end it all what's the use and you're caught and sin is more than you can cope with and you're sick of sin and sick of what it's done to your life and the more you try to be better the worse you get and you're ready to quit altogether. And you hear a voice that says, Mary, where are you? What would you do? You'd do the same thing. That's right. <laughs> You'd say, bah, as loud as you could. And my dear friend, if you really are a sinner who hates sin and you're sick of it, and you want to know God, and you want to know truth, and you want a reality, you know what you'll do? You'll say, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm over here, and I'm in sin, and I'm lost, and I can't do anything about it. I can't help myself. There's no place to turn. The harder I try, the worse I become. Is there mercy for me? Is there mercy for me? Lord Jesus, save me. And he'll be at your side, and he'll heal the wounds, and he'll put you on his shoulder and take you back to the fold. And you'll rejoice in the assurance he'll never leave you or forgive you for the rest of your life. My dear friend, if you walk out of that door and go to hell, you're going to do it with the gospel in your ears. If you perish, you're going to perish with the voice of a preacher pleading with you to trust Jesus Christ telling you about a Savior, a Savior for sinners, a Savior that a sovereign God graciously gave so a sinner like you could be saved. You'll perish with the gospel in your ears. And you'll never blame election. You'll blame your own heart because you chose to be your own God. And you wasn't going to listen to anybody but yourself. Oh, may God be gracious and open your heart to receive Jesus Christ even tonight. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we have a gospel to preach. It's not something we made up. It's not just a good idea. It's not just good psychology. It's the gospel. It's the gospel that reveals the righteousness of God. It shows how you can be a just and holy God and not deviate from any of your laws or principles and in spite of that still save guilty sinners like us. And you can do this because Jesus Christ, your son, literally died under the weight and the guilt of poor sinners like us. Your wrath was poured out upon him. And wonder of wonders, you freely, graciously invite sinners like us to come to you. We can't understand the condescension of such a great God. And yet you do. You hold out your hands. And apart from your grace, we put our fingers in our ears and we say no. Oh, God, be gracious and take the gospel and seal it past the ears into the heart of hearts. Our children, we cry out to thee, oh, God, make them see the awfulness of sin and bring them to believe in a mighty Savior. And we will praise you for all you accomplish for the rest of our life and for all eternity. We will sing of your electing grace. For Christ's sake, hear our prayers. Amen. Check out our websites 
BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the